Alleluia. Alleluia. Alleluia, Lord. Alleluia, Lord. Alleluia, Lord. Alleluia, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we have shouted Alleluia. Amen. Hallelujah. to uh, spend a little time in the word lord have your own way in our hearts and our lives draw us closer and closer to you that we might be the image of you lord jesus when the world would look at us that they would be able to see jesus some sometimes the only the only jesus that some of the world will ever see is us help us lord jesus that we might mirror you in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Before the beginning of time, there was a meeting. In attendance, there was one. You can sit down. In attendance, there was one, but there was three. Three expressions of the one. Three persons of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It was decided that they would make a being like themselves. He would have free will so that he could choose to love them. Of course, they knew that this being, not actually being God, would fail. So before the foundation of the earth, they planned a salvation for these creatures. It was a beautiful plan. All the bases were covered. In the beginning, God stood in the stillness and speaking his creative words, he spoke the earth and the heavens into existence and it was good. He finished with the sun and the spirit standing next to him by creating the living soul that they had planned and he breathed life into it and called it Adam. Thus began the march of history through time. The righteousness of God marched down through time. The righteousness of God saw the retribution on a young man for killing his brother in jealousy. It saw the Egyptian army wiped out in the Red Sea for rebellion against God. It saw the delay of the children of Israel getting to their promised home because of sin. It saw the blessing of God on his people when they chose to live right and the desolation of his people when they rebelled. The righteousness of God saw the blessing on the man after God's own heart when he was walking in righteousness 
and saw the death of his son and another time the destruction of his army when he chose the way of self. Though there were times when the grace and mercy of the Father peeped through, there came a point in the fullness of time, in the fullness of time, when righteousness joined with grace and mercy on a hill outside Jerusalem, where the sky drew dark, thunder crashed, and the veil of God's temple was rent from top to bottom, and a personal relationship with the Father was made available to all who would ask the Savior to cover their sins with his blood and come in and be the Lord of their life. This was an exciting and wonderful journey that mankind was able to participate in, but now came a new aspect to this journey. It was a journey, not just a one-time thing. The scriptures Sorry. The computer wants to update something. The scriptures describe it as walking. Romans 8, 4 to 5, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. So the Lord has instructed his apostles to train us in the journey, the walk of our new life. The RCCG has a program in Nigeria called Digging Deep. We're going to call this series The Deeper Life. battery out. I don't know. Okay, skip that. The deeper life, learning to go deeper. We do very well. We do very well every Sunday and throughout our prayer lives, attacking the outside things that would bring us down. We come against and bind all of the other things that would try to bring us down, tear us apart, uh, uh, inhibit our effectiveness, uh, draw us down, make us what we ought not to be uh, in our lives. We do very well in attacking those things. What I want us to look at is the enemy within, ourself, dealing with the deeper life, learning to go deeper. And part one, this is a series, three-part series. Part one is Jesus' most crucial battle. Now, you're going to wonder at first, how does that have to do with the deeper life? Let's go into it. Jesus' most crucial battle. Let me lay out the story a little bit. Uh, Jesus had already gone through Pilate's Hall then been sent over to uh, Herod, then he came, he was sent back over to uh, Pilate's hall. And um, for those of you, of course, Pilate was not a Christian, but in my opinion, Pilate was not an evil man. As a matter of fact, Pilate, without knowing Jesus, seemed like he was probably a decent human being as far as Romans go. Uh, he even said, when they brought him to him, he investigated and he said, uh, I don't find anything wrong with this man. He wanted to let, the, uh, let Jesus go. In fact, his wife had told him that she had seen something in a dream. Don't have anything to do with uh, doing bad to this man. He was bent toward letting Jesus go. So here's the beginning of the most crucial battle. What would have happened? Remember, Pilate started asking Jesus questions. Jesus didn't answer much. 
At one point he said, Are you the king of the Jews? And what Jesus answered was not a totally direct answer to Pilate that maybe he wasn't even totally sure of the meaning, but Jesus said, you have said it. In other words, yeah, I am. But he tried to keep the conversation to a minimum. Why? What if Jesus had convinced Pilate to let him go? I don't care about you rabble-rousing Jews. I don't care. You can bring down Caesar on my head. I don't care. I'm not going to do it. My wife had a dream, and I don't see anything wrong with this man, and I like him myself, and I like his answers. I'm letting him go. What would have happened? Would you have salvation today? No. The most crucial battle of Jesus, and you got to imagine, imagine with me, Satan and Jesus dueling with swords. We've probably all seen some kind of fencing on TV or something like that. And they thrust and they jab and they block and thrust and different things like that. And then we've seen, that's just fencing, that's, that's play stuff. But then there's real battles that have happened back in the dark ages and stuff where all the fighting and stuff was done through, through swords. And here's Jesus and Satan. They're, they're dancing around and they're thrusting and they're jabbing. Satan believed he was winning. And that's exactly where Jesus needed him to be. Because... Jesus didn't intend to win this battle. He was going to win by losing the battle. Understand? Mm -hmm. He had to die on the cross. So Jesus was going to win by losing the battle. So he had to keep Satan involved. And when Pilate asked a question, he had to say just enough till Pilate went ahead against his better judgment and said, go ahead and crucify him. I'm washing my hands of this. And then they took Jesus out to the hill of Golgotha. And the soldiers put nails through Jesus' hands, his wrists, and they raised him up. And you know the story of Jesus' crucifixion and the, 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 sword battle between Satan and Jesus was still going on. And here's an interesting thing. Did you know that Jesus died three deaths that day? One was the flesh. Our flesh dies when we die. One was the spirit. Um, he said, into, into, my, uh, into your hands I commend my spirit. Mm -hmm. And one was the soul or the self. All three aspects had to die that day on the cross. And then came the resurrection. So when when we um, talk about the flesh, the spirit, and the soul or the self dying, let's translate that. The same will happen to all of us eventually. We have three aspects. We're tripartite beings. We have flesh, that's our body. We have a uh, spirit, and we have the soul or the self. We're all going to have those same three deaths. But let's take this in. Jesus was having this battle with Satan and he won by losing. And then he, he was resurrected. And we have a resurrected. That's the reason why Christianity exists because we have a resurrected redeemer. Not just because he died. 
And now there's a spiritual application. Lay, uh, the, the, the flesh, when the, when the flesh dies, okay, the spiritual application is in our spiritual lives, we begin the spiritual journey by an interaction with Jesus. We come to him, we're sick of our sin, we repent of our sin, and we come to a relationship with Jesus by forgiveness of our sins, and now we're, we're born again. But then there's a journey that goes on, and there's things that have to be dealt with. Paul talks at one point about the um, dying daily. And so the flesh and the spirit, I, I mean, the, the flesh, let, let's, let's imagine for a minute, if, if, we, if we went to a teaching hospital and we got a uh, corpse, a cadaver, and we brought it in here and it had no breath and it had no uh, spirit and it had no anything, it's just a body. If you brought that body in here, you could uh, tantalize it with money, it wouldn't respond. You could tantalize it with, um, I mean, maybe it had a bad habit in the past, smoking or something. You could tantalize it with cigarettes, it wouldn't respond. You could tantalize it, maybe it had a, had a, 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 a fetish for food. It loved food. You could tantalize it with strawberry shortcake or pizza or succulent steak. Would it respond? No. Because the flesh is dead. And this is what we need to do in our own life. We're, we're, we're talking about the deeper life, learning to go deeper. And what we still have when we come alive unto Jesus Christ, is we still have the flesh. This may not all be uh, theological, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not positive, but this is my view, okay? You can check it out, and you can argue with me later if you want to. I think that when we become born again, our flesh doesn't get saved. We have a flesh, and we have the spirit, and we have the soul or the self. The soul, uh, some people say that's the mind, will, and emotions. I think the one aspect, here, let's go a little further here. The, the flesh, let me back up just a little bit. The heart is deceitful. This is the flesh part. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Romans 8, 6 says, The mind set on the flesh is death. So, we're, in Romans 8, we're even talking about a born-again person, okay? But, when the mind is set on the flesh, that is death. Romans 8, 7, uh, the, the flesh, uh, some versions like the King James, King, King James Version refers to it as the um, carnal mind. And so some people have made that into a piece of theology themselves and they say, you have carnality and you need to get that carnality extracted from you as though that's some kind of a um, festering poisonous thing and that it's able to be extracted you there's an operation the Holy Spirit can do and pull that out of you I totally disagree the flesh is just the flesh and the scriptures say the flesh is hostile to God and it doesn't subject itself to the law of God because like what we were talking about if we brought a cadaver here 
You could tempt it with bad things or you could tempt it with good things. It wouldn't matter because the flesh doesn't respond when it's dead. But let's say you, before you got saved, you loved, you craved strawberry shortcake. Every chance you got, your, your wife would even get after you. You're eating too many strawberry shortcakes. So now you will sneak off to somewhere and you will get a strawberry shortcake and never tell her about it. Because, oh my goodness, I can't. I live for the next good strawberry shortcake. You tell me of a new place that has a better strawberry shortcake and I'm there. And I won't take my wife because she wouldn't like it. But I love strawberry shortcake. Now you get saved. Came to a revival meeting, whatever, you, uh, uh, you're convicted of your sins and stuff like that. You come forward. Oh, thank God. Hallelujah. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. My, my heart is rejoicing. Next day, strawberry shortcake. <laughs> Got to have some more strawberry shortcake. Why? Your flesh didn't get saved? Your flesh is your flesh. It just is flesh. Does that mean it's okay? That does that mean it's okay to be to be dominated by your flesh? No. But when you're saved, your flesh is still your flesh. Verse eight: Those in the flesh cannot please God. Those walking after the flesh cannot please God. Those who are le letting the flesh dominate them cannot please God. So we've got to do something with the flesh. And then we do have the soul or the self, which again, uh, the soul and the self, the mind, will, and emotions, they're similar to the flesh. They still don't get actually saved because like, if you've allowed yourself to uh, become dominated by food, or by smoking, or by habits, or some things like that. Now, we all know, we've all heard stories that there are dynamic things that can happen. God can deliver a person from alcohol, like that. God can deliver a person from cigarettes, like that. It doesn't happen that, ever, uh, that way every time. Sometimes God wants that person to go through the process of overcoming the things that they have been, allowed themselves to get into in the past. Why? Because their mind, will, and emotions are already corrupted. And the Spirit, God, wants us to come into a place where we have discipline over the flesh and discipline over the soul, mind, will, and emotions, the self. And the way that happens, the one part of you that did get born again, and in fact, the one part of you that when you die is going to go on into eternity is your spirit. And that's where you have to deal with these issues of flesh and self. Self, I remember a story of a, of a, a, a little uh, two-year-old kid. And he was very strong-willed. And he was uh, sitting down. And his, um, and his mother said, or he was standing up. And his mother said, sit down. And he didn't want to sit down, so he didn't sit down. Now she got quite aggravated, and she went over to paddle him and said, I said, sit down, you sit down. And he finally sat down, but he said, but I'm still standing up inside. <laughs> That's the self. And the self has to learn to become disciplined by the Spirit. Romans 8, 13 says, by the Spirit putting to death the deeds of the flesh. So when we get saved, our spirit becomes alive unto God. 
Now we have to do something with the spirit. The spirit can get weaker or the spirit can get stronger. But the spirit is the one that puts to death the deeds of the flesh. The spirit is the one that helps our, our self to come into alignment with the will of God. There's the washing of the water of the word the scriptures talk about. John 17, 17, Jesus is praying for his disciples and he said, sanctify or cleanse them through your truth. He said, then your word is truth. So our spirit has to become trained by getting into the word, by getting into the scriptures, by attending to the means of grace, like coming to church, like conversations with pastors and godly people and things like that. Sanctify, cleanse them through your truth. Your word is truth. Seek first. Seek first. Seek first the kingdom of God. This line is illustrating life as a Christian. On one end is the flesh and one end is the spirit. And the, Romans 8 was talking about they that walk after the flesh mind the things of the flesh. And the flesh, it says, is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God. It can't be because it's just flesh. It has to be controlled by the spirit. But if the spirit is walking after the flesh, or if yourself is walking after the flesh, and, uh, and your spirit is walking after the flesh, not minding the spirit of God, then you're going to become more and more minding the things of the flesh. The more you mind the things of the flesh, the less you will hear the voice of the Spirit. But if you get into a good service or a revival and you've kind of been backsliding and you're drawn back, oh, I want to be a part of this. I want to be a part of the kingdom. I want to live to glorify God. And so you get, get your spirit straightened back out. You still have to deal with those things because the, the closer you get to the flesh, the more strawberry shortcakes I eat, the more I want to eat strawberry shortcakes. But if I can draw away from strawberry shortcakes for a while, now it's like, yeah, that would be nice, but it doesn't have as much power over me. I've been doing a diet called the keto diet. And I'm not going to go into all the details of it, but when you when you train your body, when you change your body from from uh, burning sugar or carbs over to burning fat, then your body has less cravings for food, and it has been the most amazing diet for me because I'm one that has had struggles with food, and. Uh, I've been one that sometimes would sneak and get something that I probably shouldn't. You know, the strawberry shortcake that I wouldn't tell my wife about. I've done those things because flesh is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. And my spirit was weaker. And it was like, okay, go ahead and have strawberry shortcake. But with this diet, it's pulled away the, the, the cravings. I don't have cravings. In fact, I'm not even hungry as much. And this is the thing. I'm in the middle now. Here's the line. Here's flesh over here. O over here, I'm indulging flesh. Now, when, as a Christian, when you're indulging the flesh, you, you go ahead and indulge yourself in strawberry shortcakes and things like that. Now you're being obedient to the flesh. So let's say a sexual tempt temptation walks by. Am I going to be able to resist 
I'm over here indulging myself in fleshly stuff, man. I'm enjoying this. Okay, I'm not going to say that it's exactly sin to love strawberry shortcake so much, but I'm really enjoying the flesh. And sexual temp temptation walks by. Do you think I'm going to be strong? Or would, would I be stronger if I was over here and I was alive unto the spirit and I barely heard the voice of the flesh anymore? What place would I be stronger? In the spirit. Exactly. They that walk after the flesh mind the things of the flesh. They that walk after the spirit mind the things of the spirit. Romans 8 talks about walking after the flesh or walking after the spirit. Hebrews 12, 14, pursue peace with all men and pursue holy living and it goes on to say without this pursuit if I'm indulging myself in the flesh, 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 flesh just loving flesh, just loving flesh, want this flesh, oh my goodness, I'm loving life, I'm, yeah, I'm doing that. a party, yes, I'm there. If I'm just listening to the flesh, I'm not pursuing. Mm -hmm. Pursue holy living. 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 Without this pursuit, it says, you won't see God. The tongue can no man tame. How often do you put yourself first? How often do you consciously choose to put others first? We're talking about trying to get deeper, learning to get deeper. When you're putting yourself first, you're following the self. That's the thing we're trying to learn how to discipline, to come closer and closer to God, to the spirit, to relationship with him learning to live the deeper life. How often do you consciously choose to put others first? How often does putting others first just automatically happen because you trained your mind, will, and emotions, and you trained your flesh now to mind the things of the spirit, and you keep your spirit healthy with God? Paul talks about dying daily, and it takes a daily dying to our self, a daily dying to our flesh to become deeper with God.